Well, hello and welcome again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I'm uh, glad to be with you as we uh, work our way, can continue to work our way through Max Licato's book, um, Traveling Light. Today we are in chapter 14 of the book. Um, called uh, Chapter 14 is called The Crowing Rooster and Me, The Burden of Shame. Uh, clearly today we're talking about shame and uh, the incredible weight that shame uh, brings on on me as a person or, or on you as a person but also on um, I think even the people around us and I'll talk about that in just a moment but I <clears throat> underlined on page 115 of Lucado's book the uh, fourth paragraph it says Denying Christ on the night of his betrayal was bad enough, but did he have to boast that he wouldn't? And one denial was pitiful, but three, three denials was horrific, but did he have to curse? Peter began to place a curse on himself and swear, I don't know the man. Uh, of course, we're talking here about when uh, Peter, the disciple Peter, um, uh, when he denies Jesus Christ three times on the night that Jesus is betrayed before he is hung on the cross. Jesus, of course, um, mentioned to Peter, told Peter, that this was going to happen. Um, it was uh, sort of part of the plan. Um, it's, it's something where Jesus knew it was going to take place. It's, it's, it's a piece of the story, but have you ever really wondered why? Why, why did... Why is that part of the story? Did, did God intend for Peter to deny Christ? Did God sort of orchestrate that? It, it, it was it coincidental. Jesus seems pretty prepared for it when he's talking to Peter, telling Peter this is going to happen. Uh, why is it there? <clears throat> I want to tell you that I think this denial of Peter is there specifically. I don't, I don't know god's mind his plan i don't know if he did this on purpose but i certainly believe it's there for a reason and the reason is this i think it helps us to really really truly understand our normal unfortunately normal human situation before god which is one of denial think about it when we sin here on earth right when we sin which is often that sin is really nothing more than a denial of God. Now, granted, you might say, well, yeah, I sinned, but I, my, my, my purpose wasn't to deny God, wasn't to deny that he existed, that, that I knew him. Okay, I get that. Yeah, we didn't do it from a position of trying purposefully to deny God or deny Christ or deny that we know them. But ultimately, what does our sin say? It says that we don't know him. Uh, if we are sinful, right? which we're going to be, then it sort of begins to beg the question, how well do you know God? The reality of sin is that it's always going to be part of our lives here on earth. We live in a sin-filled world. Sin is a consequence of this world. But there's, I think, a difference between sin that happens because we're human we, we stumble and fall, and sin that happens because we have a purposeful intention for that sin. And when that sin is purposefully intended, for example, um, maybe there is um, actually a great example. Uh, Sarah and I have been watching uh, a show that um, details problems that addicts have um, in their lives. And uh, one of the people in the show who is uh, a recovering uh, alcoholic is talking to two other people who are recovering alcoholics. And he says, um, the reality of my situation is that I'm a drunk and I choose to be a drunk. I chose drinking a long time ago. I I've made that choice. It's a bad choice, a terrible choice. Sure, I should probably make a different one, but I've made that choice to do this. When I heard that the other night, I thought, okay, that might be an example of this sort of 
sin, this purposeful sin, right? He knows what he's doing is wrong. He knows that it's hurting him and all the other people around him, yet he chooses it, right? So the, this situation that I'm talking about is the kind of sin that we know it's wrong, we know it hurts us and other people, and yet we continue to sort of willfully choose it. You might be thinking about your life, I don't know that that kind of sin is in my life. I try really hard not to do things, right, that, that hurt other people, that hurt myself. Agreed, but I think we all kind of have this sin. If we would really take a step back and think about it, we'd probably find some place where we'd go, yeah, I know that that's, that that's not what God wants for me, but that's what I do. And, and it's not right, but I do it. Shame. How does shame go into that? Well, sin brings shame, okay? Um, our young adults group, uh, read through a book by Christine Kane called um, Unashamed. Uh, it's a book about um, her life, really, and, uh, and sort of the shame that comes with being a victim of uh, sexual harassment. <clears throat> and one of the things that we talked so much about when we were talking about shame is that shame is, is always in some way connected to sin. Either I bring shame on myself because of the sin that I have done towards someone else, towards God, you know, whatever the, might, the case might be. So I bring shame on myself or someone else brings shame on me by sinning against me. Um, so in the case of the sexual harassment, by the way, um, the shame that that person carries is not shame that they've wanted for themselves. It's been forced on them. It's something that's been pushed onto them as a result of this sin that has happened towards them. At the time we were talking about shame, I, I suggested these two things, and I will suggest them to you today also. I think they fit well with what Max Lucado is talking about. There are two sort of, well, there's one problem and one reality about shame, okay? The first is this. The problem with shame is that it always attacks our sense of worth or worthiness. Shame. The reason we call it shame is because it's sort of like that the word shame means like put down, um, uh, you know, pushed away, uh, not worthy. And, and so shame, when we carry shame, it always affects our worth, maybe in our eyes, maybe in someone else's eyes. But somehow or another, our worth is always affected. And so none of us... Who amongst us would ever say, I don't want to be counted worthy? I don't want to be worthy. I, don't, I want to be worthless. No one would ever say that. But that's what shame does. It brings a, a, a degrading in our worth. Sometimes, as we see ourselves, we don't think we're worthy because of the sin and the shame in our lives. Others look at us and say, wow, that person did that. And all of a sudden, they are not counting us as worthy. And so shame always brings this attack on our worthiness. The second thing I would tell you about shame is that there's a reality about it. First, uh, the, the reality is this. The reality of sin is that we never planned for this to happen this way. We never planned for it to get too bad. So the reality of shame is that we find ourselves in places where shame especially when it's a result of something we've done, it's gotten to the point of being shameful and we never probably expected it to get there. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen on TV um, or read about stories about hoarders, people who are hoarding things in their homes. Um, one of the things that I've noticed when I've seen that show is that almost every time the person who has done the hoarding uh, makes a statement like, <clears throat> I never, never thought it would get this bad. I never expected for it to go this far. I think the reality of shame and the sin that, ca that causes shame is that we never expected for it to go that far. Again, go back to that sexual harassment uh, example, right? Um, the, the sexual harassment. You know, the person who was doing the harassing might say, I, I never expected I would take things so far. And maybe the person who's been harassed would say, I never expected for them to go so far. Um, the reality of shame and sin is that we never plan for it to 
get to those levels. Okay, well, if these two things are true, that the problem with shame is that it always affects our worth and we never expected it to go so far, then where does that leave us? Where does that leave God, right? Um, two great pieces of gospel for you right now. The first is this. It doesn't matter how hard shame attacks your worth. Whether you have said to yourself that you're not worthy, that you're worthless. If someone else has said to you that you're not worthy or you're worthless. The, the beauty of God our Father is that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, he offers us forgiveness, grace, peace, and mercy. And, in, and tied up in that forgiveness and grace and peace and mercy is worth. He counts us worthy again. He gets rid of that sin, which then gets rid of that shame, which then can lead us to be called worthy. Uh, if you were to look up the idea of worth or, or, or worthiness in Scripture, one of the things you'd find in the New Testament is that um, uh, believers always go from a place of being unworthy to being worthy. We are unworthy in our sinfulness. We are worthy in our forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We are unworthy in our human sinfulness. We are worthy in, in, in this newborn, born again, uh, um, washed clean by Jesus state. So we go from unworthy to worthy. That's a beautiful gospel thing that God does for us. He removes the problem of shame, but... Of course, our human minds say, well, that's nice, but I still feel the shame. That's where it comes to this traveling light piece. The only way to get beyond shame and to get to worth and worthiness and to get to the place where, 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 where that, that sin, you know, maybe the desire for that thing never goes away, but it's under, it's under control. It's in check. You don't need that thing. You might desire it, but you don't need it. The only way for us to get beyond the shame of what sin does to us, right, is to put all of our worth into the hands of God, into the grace, mercy, and peace of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and know that God alone is the one who defines my worth. And so I've got to take all that shame, that guilt, and I got to put it in my suitcase, right? And I got to leave it behind because I'm trading it in for worth, for self worth. I'm trading in the things that say, I'm not worthy, I'm worthless. And I'm taking from God, from Jesus, this beautiful, beautiful thing he gives me called worth. And, and so, again, the problem with shame is that it always attacks our self-worth. Um, and the problem or reality of shame is that we never expected to be in a place where the shame would come to us. But it happens. And when it happens, the question then will be, are we, can we find ourselves in a place? Can we get to a place? Can we be willing to take the shame and the guilt and the sin and put it in the suitcase and give it away to God and take instead his beautiful blessing of forgiveness and grace and peace and mercy and find worth for ourselves again? I think that's what David means when he says he prepares a table before me. You know, Max Licato talked about how the shepherd brings the sheep into the sort of the mesa or the, the, the table of land. And he before he can do that, before he can bring the sheep into the pasture, he's got to go and, and look for all of the weeds that are going to make him sick and pull those up and look for adders and snakes and, and get rid of them so that it's safe for the sheep to go in there. He prepared the table, the mesa, for his his sheep. God prepares a table before us. We know, right, that Jesus is going to have a great wedding feast in heaven and the table's prepared for us. But this table that David's talking about is the one that's prepared in the face of my enemies. The one who, those ones who have taken my self-worth and cut it down to nothing because of the shame that either I've brought on myself or they've given to me by their sinfulness. In the presence of my enemy that takes my self-worth away, God lays out a table and he says, come, let's sit and have dinner. Let's get you that self-worth back. 
So, you know, the question really is, do you want to carry shame or do you want to carry worth? Shame is heavy. Feeling, knowing, believing, trusting that you are worthy as you stand before God our Father, that's light. That's freeing. I hope you guys have a great week this week. I hope uh, that this has helped you to kind of think about the idea of shame. I would encourage you, if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're a book reader and you'd like a really, I think, um, hard-hitting but very incredible book, um, Unashamed by Christine Kane, um, and uh, it's just a great book. So I hope to see you guys again next week. We'll be in chapter 15. Until then, have a great week.